We got 40 minutes, which usually means that we'll either go short or long or on time. Actually, it always means that we're short, long, or on time. So um, I'm not going to wait for everyone else to come in, and I really did want to go get a coffee, but I'm not. So um, who's really tired right now? Awesome. Me too. Okay, um, so what we're talking about today is contributing back as an operator. Um, so operator, integrator, manufacturer, um, what, uh, want to have just a Q&A discussion today. So we have two microphones up here. I kept it really light on slides because there's stuff that I've done inside my company to uh, build a strong business around uh, mixing in open source contributions into what we do. Um, and, and balancing that out. Um, a lot of what I do when I talk to new companies as an OpenStack ambassador, or just when I talk to the company as another operator, or I talk to individuals and companies, manufacturers, other operators, whoever, is um, sometimes they look at the beard and they want to talk about the development of things. Sometimes they want to talk about cloud platforms, SDN. Um, most of the time I talk about process. I'm talking about process and business strategies and, and a very simple realization that developers cost a lot of money and giving away code is giving away money. And so what can you do to actually do it successfully? So that's what I want to talk about. I also want to talk about how uh, by giving code back to the community, how that can help you grow. So again, the microphones are there to be used. We have a nice small thing, so why don't we get all cozy and come on in, we're all friendly. Yes, I'm looking at you in the back of the room. No, it's all right, if you don't feel like coming up, you don't have to. So um, again, this is as much about businesses as of tech. So who here is like a technologist in their business? You're in who here is a developer? Okay. Who here is a manager, a director, a vice president, a chief? Okay. Uh, who here uh, has to or wants, wants to get your business contributing code back or being a tighter member of this community? Okay, so that's a really good goal. Um, I'm going to talk in, in, in two segments here. So um, I, I'm going to talk in a business segment first and a technical segment second. Um, it, it, what I find is a lot of people go direct to the direct technical, um, how to contribute back as an operator of the technical items of it, but then they miss the business, at, the business items and they end up getting squashed. Um, general counsel, board of directors, whatever, end up having a problem. So. Um, the agenda we have. I'm going to talk about uh, why we do this, and we being the community. Uh, I don't talk a lot about the business I work for. Um, Steph, that's pretty accurate, right? I don't really talk about, actually, at what company do I work for? Exactly. And I've known you for two years. Um, so uh, I'm actually going to uh, talk about the company I work for. And it's not a sale thing. We actually don't have to sell. We just got bought a week ago, so or two weeks ago. So sweet. Yeah, had some meetings, went to Hawaii for a week, um, had my guys coding without me interrupting them. It was awesome. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, what the effect it has been on us and the effect of getting acquired, building a half billion dollar company and getting acquired was really good. And then um, uh, talking, I'm going to talk about the business topics of how we do this and stay profitable. Um, we, all have we all have a responsibility to create healthy, thriving organizations, no matter if we have stream or not. Um, and we need, you need to stay profitable to do great things for the community. I'm going to talk about the technical topics, some little tricks that we do um, that allow me to, um, as as leader in the business, uh, maintain control of intellectual property, um, avoid violating um, non-disclosure agreements, and, and uh, leakage of also partner property and uh, license code, um, and then things that we do to go ahead and there's some technical things that that we do, and we're actually growing faster and faster every day in this to be able to model the effect of open source contributions on the rest of our business. Does that sound like good topics that we'd like to talk about today? Does anyone think this is crap? Okay, cool. And if you do think it's crap, just stand up, walk out. Like that guy, right there. <laughs> it's fine. It is a lot of time you need. All right, there's not that much time in this week. So uh, this was me this morning. Yeah, th this was me doing a workshop. Or right, this is me. Uh, I had um, submitted, I think, three presentations to uh, OpenStack Design Summit. I had a list of things that I felt are important to talk about in 2014. Um, and I think all of them got accepted. I was like, damn it. Um, it, it's actually a lot of work presenting, um, and it's kind of this is a work week for me as part of the community. Um, luckily, I was so hungover after probably, well, I, I will be honest, um, I have been partying and drinking and celebrating every day since we announced. Um, and so uh, <laughs> I, I didn't realize that we actually had a workshop this morning and had a presentation, and, uh, I, and I was really lucky that I have an amazing team. 
Um, so these are, these are, this is actually one of my, uh, one of my developers, Mark McGlana, um, that uh, does uh, some, QA some QA work for Tempest. Um, is actually a really awesome dude, and he led a workshop on developing for multi-node, uh, puppetizing multi-node dev stack deployments. Um, those things allowed me to have a good morning, um, but I am under-caffeinated. Uh, I have these teams, so the, these team members are key in their open source contributions, their partnership with the community, their ability to upstream code. These team members define a competitive advantage in my business. Not only competitive advantage when I'm out, when, when we're out doing stuff for customers, but when we write our own software and platforms and we operate our own, uh, operate our own code. Having developers and engineers and architects in your company, on your team, that are engaged with an open source community is a force multiplier. We get, um, just this week, I had a friend of mine from uh, the Open Daylight side, um, who's, uh, he started mentoring me on SDN three years ago, I think. Uh, he's like, dude, you gotta check out this Professor Shanker. He thinks software should be networking. Um, and opened my eyes. And so the ability to have an organization that extends past your, your, your core capabilities and to be able to leverage architectural support, troubleshooting guidance, the support putting in a new feature, partnership in the community, especially say, if you're like us and like, we use OpenStack, we use Amazon, we use vCloud Director now, the company, acquiring company has like a billion clouds. I am, it's a goal of mine to make sure that OpenStack's sitting right next to it. Hopefully they're not listening. Um, <laughs> I think they'll like it, honestly. Um, but, um, it, and the company's died in, mentioned today, so it's owned by NTT, which has a big OpenStack cloud. So, Notchy and all of them, I'm really happy to be able to work with them. Um, I have the, so um, I have these teams, I have this ability to do, to do great things um, for the community, for the corporation, um, for, for the individuals in it, and, and specifically that little dart in the center, um, because I wear a suit a lot. Um, I, I am a business leader, I manage a p and um, I, I share successes and failures with my teams financially. Um, I am responsible for, um, well I was, uh, strategy and vision um, to set the technical directions for a 600 person, half billion dollar company. Um, and the decisions I made, good or bad, um, you know, make it so their spouses can eat or not and their kids are successful. Um, so it's very important when you're looking into open source, participating in open source software to put your business hat on as tightly as your, uh, as your technical hat. So uh, for the background, for people who don't know me, uh, I, ran I built and ran a $100 million line of business at Nexus. Um, at, at the same time, I'm kind of an undercover hippie at work, although with the beard, it's less and less undercover every day. Um, so uh, I am a serial instigator in the OpenStack community. Um, I really love connecting with people who are passionate about the same thing, that want to make this world better, the code better, share the burden of creating great things, OpenStack as a cloud platform, and running your apps on top of it. it just, it, it, it's uh, some support to me. I'm uh, an OpenStack ambassador, and the goals of our ambassador program is to lower the barriers to contributing, consuming, participating in the community. Also, active technical contributor and a co-founder of uh, OpenStack Manual or uh, core on OpenStack Manuals and uh, co-founder of OpenStack Training. Um, but on the business side, I am on the leadership team of a old stodgy business. Or uh, we got acquired, so now I'm kind of figuring out what I'm going to do. Um, but um, so, why is Open good for biz? Um, and uh, uh, by the way, if anyone has any questions about this, we can do this in the Q&A. Uh, we can do Q&A at the end, whatever. Yeah, I'm going to talk about a lot of topics, and it's okay to stand up and ask a question. Um, fundamentally, by identifying your unfair advantage in the market and clearly understanding why your company makes money. So if you want to participate, if you want to upstream code in your business, that's the first thing that anyone has to do. So uh, you have to go ahead and graph out a very simple thing. Why my company is special? What is our unfair advantage in the market? If you don't know this, you can talk to your executives, you can talk to your product managers, you talk to your salespeople. There's something that's special in there, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that supports it. Just because someone is in the same business segment as you does not mean they're your competitor. They mean, that means that they are similar to you. Usually you know if your business engages in a, comp in a competitive situation for a customer, there's ones where you'll always win and your, customer, and your competitors will always lose. Has anyone seen that in your own business? Yeah, yeah. You, if you want to successfully uh, be part of an open source community, you have to know that, you have to document that, you have to prove that to your executive team. Because there's a lot of old gold watch guys, especially if, they, if, if software is key to your company, that intellectual property is so freaking sacred, is key to the valuation, and giving it away will get you fired. 
right? So executive sponsorship. We do this, however, by, by going through that exercise to actually understand why we are successful in our business. Then we understand where we can partner in development and share the burden with our competitors. Yeah, I have competitors every day that I, that, that I partner in upstream development with here. I think it's amazing. We can do it with our customers. We can do it with our new employees, future employees maybe. Um, and, but we, there, it's very important. The goal here, here is to make it so you are operating your business in a force multiplier so that you can rapidly expand your development team based on your credibility in the market, based on the work that you've done. So I won't go too much into it. Um, open source helped us grow. Participating in the open source community helped us grow. Um, three years ago, I came to Nexus, it was $165 million. Uh, we closed the books last year at a half billion dollars, got acquired for an a undisclosed sum, I will say, um, uh, by a $5.8 billion international integrator that's owned by NTT. Um, we are contributors to OpenStack, Open Daylight, corporate sponsors of the foundation. We are half engineering, and we integrate Amazon, yeah, I said the evil word here, OpenStack and Open Daylight into our product offerings. We, we, we contribute back to OpenStack, Open Daylight, Puppet, as as well as some of our own repositories on uh, github.com uh, slash nexusis. Um, participating in this community accelerated the growth of our business and accelerated our hiring um, in a way that I could, never have, I, I could never have understood. So we're going to get into a couple of business topics here, and I want Q&A, by the way. It's important, so I didn't put a whole bunch of slides, so I'm preaching. So the business topics I want to cover here. Um, first things first we're going to talk about is talking to your executive team. So has anyone walked up, so do you have a mahogany row? Yeah? You want a question. Can you talk a little bit about how involved your legal team has been in, in determining your IP and making sure that uh, you just don't trip up? You know? Yeah, general counsel, right? So um, I'll answer that question directly. Uh, let's start right now. So um, uh, my legal is really permissive. Um, I ended up basically saying, demonstrating how um, some of these technologies were important to the business. Um, my headquarters are in California. Um, in California, there are some specific laws that if you do not, so you as an individual have rights, and they vary by state, I am not a lawyer, right? In California, in other, law, other states, there are similar laws that you are, so you are, uh, you are hired by your employers. You're not a slave of your employer, but you are employed during nine to five to accomplish work. Um, the term is work for hire. Under the contracts of work for hire, the intellectual property that you create under, on, when, when you're under work for hire are property of your employer. Now, say, uh, in California, uh, which I now have to actually, there's 32 companies around the world, so I'm going to spend a lot more time with uh, lawyers um, and not, I probably have to, I'm not sure where my role will be, but I, I think I'm kind of talented at making open source integrated with a company. And 32 dimension data companies around the world have to answer this question, so I'm thinking that's a question I want to help answer. Um, so, but uh, in California, this is actually how we started. So I talked to um, some really smart people. Um, Anise at Google was at IBM Research. Um, talked to him about um, patent law. Was, uh, I'm learning a bit about that. Uh, but very specific in California law, if your company does not make the similar product that you're working on, if you don't do it during your work hours, and you disclose it to your manager, your direct manager, and you don't even have to disclose it, and there's some gray area in there, but I'd recommend it. Hey, I'm working on smoke source projects. It doesn't compete with anything we have at work. I'm doing it on my, my nights and weekends. I just want to make you aware because I'm excited about it. That right there fits the legal requirements, by the way, um, that you're free to work on an open source project. You're free to commit. You can do it under your personal email address. Um, for the first year and a half or two years of, of open source, a uh, year and a half of open source, no, two years of open source participation in Nexus, um, I required the engineers submit it under the personal email address. I gave them authorization as a director in the business, saying, I authorize you to work on this. I gave them encouragement. I sent them to uh, Vegas when they'd submit patches. I couldn't, I couldn't adjust their MBOs at the time because I hadn't set the business case for doing this. Um, but uh, did that answer your question? Okay, so that's a the really, really good way to, to start. Because we had to actually define the value. 
Um, I was in the process, the market, three years ago, the market was absolutely transforming. Everyone thought that I was crazy for all this hippie stuff. Um, and I'm crazy. Um, but uh, I think now seeing everyone coming in, there's validation that open stack's important to business, right? Um, some other projects that are, you know, open daylight, if you're not in it, get in it. Um, but uh, being able to map out that graph and go through your market test and validation and really clearly understand of why you make money, what differentiates you. Um, it's really easy, by the way. Don't say because I'm first to market. That's not an unfair advantage, that's an advantage. Other people come to the market, steal that advantage. So talking to the executive team means talking in business sense. It means going through and graphing that out, creating the tables, um, clearly understanding and actually estimating the monetary value. And, and there's a, there's a, who, has anyone read uh, The Lean Started by Eric Rise? If you're going to do this for your executive team, please go through and read The Lean Started by Eric Rise. Um, the build, measure, learn pattern, of build something, measure its effect in the market, document your learnings and pivot or persist out of it, is something that's very, very effective and is a way of communicating, I'm going to try open source contributions, I'm gonna measure its impact, I'm gonna learn from it, and you can actually use that to fill out a thing called a lean canvas, which defines what you believe your business is, and you can do this with your business leader, um, and it actually goes, allows you to define your monetization vehicles, how your business makes money, and a lot of times, if you haven't taken a look at it, um, you'll be surprised how you actually make money, your unfair advantages in the market, things, the metrics that you'll use to measure it. All these things are things that you have to do and that we did, uh, I did to start with, um, and presented to the executive team. Um, luckily, I reported to them, so it worked out. It's a little bit easier. If you are lower in the organization, that doesn't mean you're unimportant, it just means you're closer to the, you're, you're closer to the needs of your customers. Um, you need to get an executive mentor. Um, I would suggest um, executives execute. We say yes or no. Um, try going one level bef below, like that VP director. They're generally looking for an initiative that will give them juice. They're looking for the initiative that will allow them to say, I, did a, I, I identified a challenge in the company and I pushed it forward. Um, they will support you. Um, so the, that, that, that is identifying that unfair advantage and you do need to find the mentor. If you are that person in your company, look downwards. Look for the people there that are trying to make this change, help them out. So uh, the legal challenges, when you talk about, about uh, talking to counsel, um, the big challenge with counsel is no's default, right? If you come up as an individual from a contributor for the company without legal precedent um, for contributing, um, they're gonna say no by default. The best thing that you could do to start this is to get people in your company contributing under their personal email addresses at night, right? Now there's some companies like if you work at Cisco, because of the massive protection of intellectual properties, then what you have to do is, if you're at a large enough company that's multi-billion dollars, you probably already have someone in the company that's kind of leading this charge in front of you. Uh, if you were at CIS, I'm just, I saw Jay sitting down. Um, when uh, Lou Tucker, did anyone see Lou, Lou standing up around here? Uh, he was one of the first guys, uh, kind of did like a lot of Java, was CTO at Sun, came to Cisco. He's, he's a guy, he's the reason Cisco does anything with, with OpenStack. Um, and if you're a friend of Lou, you are now like a CTO, pretty much. Um, uh, serious. Um, so he basically created a little shadow team, and, and he as a vice president, uh, or as a senior vice president, I'm not sure, um, created, his, uh, uh, basically created air cover, and for OpenStack, there's a thing called a corporate licensing agreement, so a CLA. So if you're gonna contribute to OpenStack, um, there is a individual's contributor licensing agreement, an ICLA, and then there's a CCLA if your corporation has decided that they, want to, that they want to control what your commits are. Once they've decided that, you really can't violate it, honestly. Um, it, it breaks a lot of the governance for, for, the, for the project, puts things in, in, the, in the scary legal areas. Um, so don't mess with the, you know, if you see, look for the CCLA. If you have an ICLA, you're gonna have to basically uh, fold some commitments into this and say that um, I am authorized to give this and you have to be truthful about it. If you're not authorized to commit the code, don't commit it. Okay, so next thing is, is uh, one thing that's actually really interesting to me. Once you've gone ahead and talked to your executive team, now you've, uh, and, and again, business centric, everyone forgets the business, and, and you have buy-in from your executive team where they at least have given you authorization and allow you to explore the financial impacts of sharing the burden of, of, of updating your, uh, of, of developing the cloud platforms that you run on. You've gone ahead and cleared with legal and you said, hey, I'm going to go ahead and do this and this is why. By the way, your general counsel will listen to the president of your company. 
It's why you have to have an executive sponsor. If you, legal will say no, right? Um, at that point, you can demonstrate, and we'll get into the technical side of it, there's some intellectual property protections in the, in the, in the second half. Uh, some processes that we use internally, because um, I have access to, uh, let me see, and the NDA portions of all of Cisco's SDN controllers, I also have access to the NDA portions of all of VMware's NDA, uh, uh, SDN controllers, and they hate each other. They want each other destroyed. Um, and I refuse to leak anything out. I'm like, I'm an integrator. I'm just got to be able to install the shit. Excuse me, stuff. Um, <laughs> um, and like, I, I just, you can compete on your own. I'm just going to be a nerd. Um, and so being able to, they're having some protections, programmatic protections that allows us to maintain the governance is really important. But communicating the technical topics is really important to legal, by the way. So um, we'll talk about a little about setting MBOs. So who, who uses management by objectives in their organization? Three? Come on. Four, five. Okay. Who at least has them in your contract and you, it's like something extra, but you don't get your coaching sessions, you don't actually manage people with them? Okay. So um, I'm actually a big fan of setting objectives mutually with your associates and your employees, it's having them set their goals and figuring out what you can do to achieve them. Um, once you've identified the business impact of, of, of contributing back to open source, when you've, once you've identified the benefits and you can start to estimate the, finan the financial gains from it, you now have a business reason for taking someone, and that might be yourself, by the way, who wants to get a bonus for submitting upstream code? Okay, guess what? If you're a developer on teams that report up to me, 50% what part of your MBO. You're, you're managed to 50% uh, of your software development time shall be upstream. Of that, so 30% corporate directed upstream, validated through our systems and measured in your MBO. 20% of that is self-directed, I can't say no. That, and that is to your discretion, right? I can make sure the intellectual property didn't leak, um, but that's very, very important because a lot of times uh, you get stuck committing on nights and weekends. Like who doesn't feel that, that who feels that they have to um, work on open source projects on their nights and their weekends? Who wants to do it during the day? Well, guess what? You can either leave your company, which actually isn't the best thing to do because the person behind you is going to be in that same trap. Uh, or you can set and help your manager be a better manager. And you can say, hey, I'd like to understand the objectives of why I think I can be successful. I want to go ahead and share those with you ahead of time so we can mutually agree to them. I want to go ahead and define the, the performance indicators and the metrics to understand how we're mutually successful. And I'm going to both, uh, uh, I'm going to manage myself and you're going to manage me to this and we're going to mutually achieve those goals. When I mutually achieve those goals, there's going to be a financial benefit for me and you. Right? By the way, that's the right way of doing an MBO. Open source contributions can be in there. I would suggest talking to your manager in this fashion. You have to tie it back to the business case. If you say, I feel safe, I feel at home when I'm with my hippies with beards and tattoos, and I want to do this nine to five, and you can't tell me, if you can't tell me the business reason why I'm setting your MBO, and that could be personal growth, that could be I, I, you know, increased retention, it could be all whatever, but if you can't tell me, it's not going to your MBO. If you can't tell me why it's important to you, you need to tell that to your manager. Um, next thing is, uh, and by the way, does anyone have any questions on the MBO side of that? Yes, no, maybe so? Okay. Um, uh, who's comfortable talking to their manager about changing your pay structure? It's a way you can get more, by the way. <laughs> you don't have to quit. <laughs> um, but uh, you should get, Go ahead, sir? Yeah. It's achieving what they committed to. So, it, it, so uh, when you start forming a, as you make the transition from engineering to development, you're going to move from like ticketing systems and everyone calling you um, to someone else committing or estimating your time, which isn't really accurate anyways, and you having a billion priorities. By the way, there's only such a thing as one priority. Everything else is subservient to that. And you know what? Prioritizing is creating a list. We don't have five top priorities. That's stupid, right? So um, what you'll end up doing is switching over probably to a, a, a Kanban board. Uh, you probably use Scrum, right? So we use Scrum, hybrid Scrum Kanban. You probably do start doing waiting to your tasks, to finding out epics and stories instead of projects. Um, once you start doing this, 
if you do it right and if you build a proper software team, which by the way is part of this transition, is you have to actually be a mature software, uh, a modern software development organization, is now the work that you do is roughly, you're normalized by the team, so it's not the hours that's in the waiting, it's the effort. And so I can actually look per person and I can see the percentages of their time focused on certain things. And if you do upstream work in our Kanban, we use Trello. Um, uh, by the way, if any of you use Trello, I love it. It's not open source. I wish story, uh, you know, I screw wishing. I need to put de de devote resources to making storyboard a little bit more mature. But um, there's a project Rosetta inside of the, um, it's in preview release right now, so um, don't use it until we get our tests up there. Um, Maglan is, uh, our, the QA engineer that wrote it is being put on um, the uh, uh, improving the Tempest suite for some app policy stuff in Neutron. Uh, for, for the next month, so that's more important at the time. But uh, so what we do is we actually pull from the Trello APIs, um, we normalize those, because Trello is actually not, it's optimized for security and speed, not accuracy. Um, and then we normalize all of those and we, establish, we, we pull all of our metrics, our, you know, the time something stuck and impeded, um, the percentage of, of, of cards that came in the backlog, um, and we also have an upstream tag. And so I have the username associated with it, or I don't, my, my teams do. Um, I have stream two, by the way. Um, I have upstream tag and then what project, and that ties in, um, right now it's a manual process for observing what goes through our CI system. So if you upstream, if you want to get paid for it, it goes through our CI system right now. Um, it, it's, um, there is a lot of other upstream, like the rest, that's under my team, the rest of the company is still under contribute on your own time on your own email. And so it's, I mean, in the process, or it's been a two year process of moving from, and I hate the word centers of excellence, but early R&D to organizational execution, like having scrum of scrums, having our ops teams now have development managers, that type of stuff. Um, so it's about 250 of them on the ops side. So we're in, the, in that process normalizing, you, you gotta be careful doing organizational transformations. Too slow is bad, too fast is worse, right? Um, but so uh, check out Project Rosetta on github.com slash nexusis. Um, that's a tool for pulling those KPIs. And so we, can, I, we have a very simple report you can get pulled. Um, I have a, a, business pro, a business analyst who's also a scrub master, five years of Deloitte, ITSM, ITIL expert. Um, I have him run the reports for me. Um, trying to, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably in about, I don't know, probably about 60, 90 days, we'll have time to put, that, put some more improvements back in our backlog and just make it so that's our, automatically done in the CI system. Um, did I answer your question about KPIs? Um, so that's, by the way, imp important. If you, by the way, horrible managers um, manage via MBOs based on their perception of their employees. Um, it, it is a horrible thing. You're not doing a manager. You're just lazy. Um, so it happens to all of us, but establishing the, and sorry if I just described something. <laughs> um, and if I piss anyone off, just welcome to Colin. Um, so, uh, hey, piss Jay off. Screw you too. Um, uh, that's a really good friend of mine. Um, but uh, ta-da, who's an awesome swing dancer. Um, if you were at the HP party, you probably saw him rocking it. But um, so the, 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 it also helps deal with special kid syndrome. Um, one thing that you're gonna find is that open source attracts a certain type of person who has um, um, many types of people. Um, and uh, in any engineering organization, we have a constrained skill. When you feel that you are better, when you feel that you're awesome, it's all right to feel awesome. It's all right to know that you're awesome. Like I am an amazing freaking person and a great business leader and a horrible developer, but I try, right? I also know that when I sit in the community, I'm surrounded by people who are smarter than me, who are more successful than me, who are more engaged with the community and are the most humble people you'll ever talk to, right? And by the way, prima donnas kill your open source contributions. So if you get someone who's pissing off the community, guess what, you got no support. Okay? One person kills your business benefit. So dealing with those special kids, uh, the biggest thing you can do is visibility. Biggest thing you can do. And it's also it's the same true in any software team, whether it's your in, in, internal software, which by the way is your infrastructure, or external. Um, the visibility and accountability, managing your scrum. So open source contributions need to be talked about in your daily standups. Open source contributions need to be shown in your showcases. Open source contributions need to you as a manager, as a director, as a chief, or a VP, need to go ahead and participate in that community and validate. And what you may find is some of the quietest people in your organization are the most impactful. And the loudest people in your organization might be dragging you down. Um, so there's, there's things they can do. Uh, Mary and Jim Poppendike, they, they have some really great books about managing agile software development teams. They also start to cover the psychology of these things. Um, and if you, if you listen to a lot of people in the DevOps movement are talking about Calm and whatnot, um, you look at like John Alspa, um, Bacigalupe is floating around here today, John Willis has talked about this too. Um, let's get to patents, I got 10 minutes, so I wanna get to the technical stuff. 
patents are really, really complicated. Um, really, really complicated. Um, in open source, uh, you choose to give away your right. You choose to dictate who has the right to copy the software that you own. Um, you have the right to make a copy. You dictate that you always own the copyright unless you grant it. You legally give it away. And that's, that's a very important distinction. So a lot of people forget this. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's been some email discussions on the email list about putting copyrights in code, uh, thing, uh, text in a folder. It's important to understand and communicate this, that you own copyright until you choose to license it. And if someone violates that copyright, and I've had personally uh, peer, uh, peer companies um, who uh, uh, violated copyright and sold something back to me, I own the copyright. My company owns the copyright and we can dictate whether to litigate against them. And I chose to just call the CTO and tell them that I wasn't really happy with it. You're an awesome company that does amazing things in open source, but I will not stand for this behavior, not because it, it, it screws me, but because there's someone out there who's working nights and weekends, right? Um, and we have, to, we have to control that. So understanding copyrights and intellectual property is really important. One of the things that I do internally to, uh, and with my teams is I don't mix code. I don't mix code. Um, I would make a very vulgar reference of protecting yourself, but um, what we do is we clearly identify the, open, the projects that we want to upstream. And so we have a rule in our code, and I'll use our, our, code, our puppet code for example. So we have this uh, project called Denica, where we're, we're, re, we're refactoring it right now to re, basically tra to separate all the commercial code from the op upstream code or the open source code. Um, it's a CI tool chain that allows you to do SDN modeling. So if you want to model like a, an OpenFlow application, OpenFlow switching applications, SDN controller, positive and negative tests together, it goes and spins it up, automatically deploys a cloud platform to do it. It's pretty neat. Um, there's some commercial code mixed in there. And so for us, we, and I'm actually gonna jump ahead to the technical stuff. Actually, no, I won't. Uh, there's, so we use Git Garrett Jenkins. So is, who uses Garrett every day? Okay. First things first, you have to become comfortable with using software tool chains to be able to protect your intellectual property. Your software tool chains and specifically your governance modules. Um, so Git is a, is, is, uh, is a distributed version control system. It's what we use inside uh, uh, OpenStack. Jenkins is a CI, it's like a, a manufacturing line for software. It's like an automation tool chain for, for building everything together, testing and providing reports. Garrett is also a tool that we use in, in, the, in OpenStack, and it's a governance tool. You can say, this person is authorized to do this to this code. I can only do this if four people review it and an authorized person approves it. This person is the only one who could release it out. By the way, this tool for, the, for the, the lawyer question, for legal, one of the things that you can do is you can allow your lawyers to do code review. You can give them access to Garrett. You can allow them the, you, can, uh, you can delegate to them the ability to release to GitHub. Think about that. They are worried about release of intellectual. Someone is. It's their choice, it's not yours. Delegate it to them. Here, press the button. And then measure how long your projects are stuck and impeded because they didn't press a button. Pass that metric right back up to the executive sponsor. And so once you've aligned how open source supports your business, now you can show how your lawyers are wasting you money by not allowing that patch to get back up. And then you can also uh, assign the 22% cost metric for sustainment engineering of any piece of code you write. Say, oh, if I write a piece of code, I'm gonna have 22% of my time maintaining it. That's a cost. Here's our profits. Here's, here's legal. Where's the gap? And you can communicate that. And you still give them the right. It's actually really, really powerful. Uh, I'm very lucky that Nexus, that Nexus Legal Literally, they were just happy that I reviewed contracts before I passed it up to them, because I'm kind of anal about that stuff. Um, did I mention data legal? I'm getting to know them. Um, they already have uh, open, upstream, uh, some upstream development. Uh, NTT has a lot of upstream development. If it looked like what Nachi's been able to do in ISIL. Is IS, Steph, is it ISIL or ISIS? Uh, the, the Nachi, who Nachi works with? Nachi Ono? Neutron? No, okay. Yeah, I'm still learning. I'm like, hey, you're my coworkers now. Um, <laughs> okay. Anyways, um, so secondly, uh, market benefits, uh, marketing benefits of contributing. Right there, OpenStack Foundation sponsor. I will tell you right now, there's all sorts of integrators and, uh, and operators in the world. They're like, we're OpenStack, and they installed it. They have, that they don't contribute code back. 
Um, and they don't put their money where their mouth is, because guess what? The foundation are people that have to actually get paid salaries. The CI systems cost money. Making it so all, all, uh, all of us can come together, do you notice how those tickets were really cheap? It's because it's not a for-profit enterprise. I pay $25,000 a year to support the foundation, and guess what? It has huge marketing benefits. It differentiates my company from others. Same thing by going, and I don't have the slide, I have a big slide that I normally give when I'm talking to another CTO or something like that, or I'm not a CTO, I'm a person now, an associate, I like it. Um, but um, when, I, when I'm talking, I, talk, I have like this, here's our resume of open source projects. So like, oh, well that's interesting, there's great marketing benefits. So who does things for other people here? No one, okay. So you're like integrators, consultants, right? Yes? Is anyone a consultant, an integrator, a VAR, uh, an operator who sells services to customers that consume it? Yeah, exactly. Well, guess what? So uh, the Denica SDN um, a modeling platform, I have a weight inside of there. So we have a, a bidding module that'll go in like bracket, bracket bid Amazon, bracket, and if you have a pricing app, I'll try bracket bid that, and then pass up to an abstraction layer. In that abstraction layer, I have a weighting. I call it a stake weight, right? Um, and that, that weighting is a preference. And that preference is adjusted to who we've partnered with, who maybe have taken us out for steak and beer. Um, but, uh, but those are the things that are actually important. I choose based on mutual participation in the company who I run my workloads on. So there's a huge benefit, huge, huge benefit. Also, if you're in your partnerships, if, you're, if partnerships are important to your business, being able to advertise those is very important. So. Uh, again, through the, the marketing benefits that I've had, um, it's been really, really good. And since um, uh, Nexus IS and Dimension Data are, their systems integrators or cloud operators, there's a bunch of stuff they do, business process consulting, um, agile consulting, and, and cloud nesting and development, um, that the, um, the marketing benefits of this for, for me have been part of my unfair advantage in the market that it's really hard for my competitors to actually participate in a community because a lot of them are gold watch used car salesmen types, right? And that it's really that if you don't have a certain amount of engineers and developers in your company, it, you cannot participate in this. If you don't have people like you sitting in this room who care, it is impossible to go ahead and participate and win. Um, that's one of my unfair advantages and I believe is an unfair advantage of the, of the acquiring company. So let's get into technical topics. So. Who, I, I mentioned, I saw a really small lack of hands of who uses or knows about Git, Garrett, and Jenkins. So can we just get another, who knows and has and uses Git, Garrett, and Jenkins? Okay, about half. So, um, I, let me see. For those that don't, I want you to open up your notepad, your laptop, write something down. Go into YouTube, um, PuppetConf 2011, Jez Humble Continuous Delivery. Right? It, it, was a key, it was Jez's keynote talk um, in, um, at, at PubCom 2011, and it's just an uh, overview of software manufacturing lines. It's not technical, it's conceptual. It talks about business value. Uh, Git, Garrett, and Jenkins are the three tools that are core to the workflow that we use to develop OpenStack. Um, it's also very, very common um, to implement those yourself. Now, these tool chains are how you will maintain control of your intellectual property. These tool chains are how you will maintain core review or peer review. This is how you will allow someone to control of or ability to support, should I say, and control and support. They're kind of can be properly supporting someone allows them, stops them from getting out of control, right? Um, that it allows you to go in, in, in and implement like peer review. So, for example, you're saying you're going to have properly formatted code that goes up into GitHub. Your guy will enforce a certain license in Apache 2.0. I actually don't, I delegate it. You can do whatever you want. Um, I prefer if it's Apache 2.0. I like him to have that choice. Um, the, you can say, uh, if I don't have a dock attached, if my test coverage is too low, I'm not gonna release. You can do the right thing. So these CI systems, so Git, it's version control, it's where you check things into. You know, you don't just put a, put a file in a folder. Intellectual property is something as value and you need to, you need to maintain and track. Um, yeah, Garrett ties into it. Garrett, when you submit a patch, you submit it to Garrett and kind of it's technically integrated Git very tightly, but it goes ahead and has rules like, 
I need to test this. I need to make sure that someone lo looked at it and reviewed it before it moves forward. I need to build it completely and make sure it works. I, can, you can, I need to have someone that's responsible for the business approve its release to the next step, right? It's very, very powerful. It also allows you to start to delegate that responsibility to people who understand or are closest to the code, who know better than you, and you can sit and review it if you're on the, if you're on the leadership or executive side. It also allows you, if you're an individual contributor or, or, or technical leader, to be able to go ahead and push that up so you get the responsibility delegated down to you, but it allows you to establish the metrics. Time, my time up. So I'm going to finish right through this. Um, it allows you to authorize, uh, authorize those things programmatically. Um, so we talked about mapping commits to MBOs earlier. So that's really, really important. You need to have consistent tagging. Um, one of the things I'm, that I'm doing right now, uh, or is teed up in our backlog, is to map the, the hashtags of the upstream hashtag to project, pull data out of uh, Taleo, uh, no, Trackstar, which is our MBO tool, normalize that together, and then implement uh, tracking in, in, Git Garrett, in, in the uh, Garrett message. So like if you commit to OpenStack, say implements BB slash whatever, that's the bug. You need to have implements you know, upstream slash whatever. It's implementing that full cycle. I'm not there yet. Um, we do have the raw data that we manually do it to be able to support it. Um, second thing is pulling data out programmatically. So that when I talked about the unfair advantages in the market, one of our unfair advantages is we, when we partner with a customer or a manufacturing partner or another offer, and, and operator is just good and all, but for money, making money, we partner with a, a, a manufacturing partner or, or a customer. Sometimes the customer is money, sometimes customers are operators. Um, we see a rise in revenue in that customer. We see an increase in margins. They don't squeeze us as much because we're not a leech. We're just we're providing value. We see in, um, other products that we sell. We sell a whole bunch of BS, like phones and stuff, extra product categories that get sold, and we see the time to sale shorten. It's basically a sign that, hey, I realize in value you're partnering with me, and here's some stuff to fund it. And then all I'll do is I'll shave off some margin out of that and, and fund some software development team, like put some stuff that's important to them higher. Um, it's, that's totally valid, by the way. It's okay to upstream software that's, that's important to your business. It's not okay to undercut your partners in upstream software development. It's not okay to compete in that way. It's okay to succeed, right? Um, but one of the things is that we're pulling, uh, pulling the data manually out of salesforce.com, which is where all, all of our stuff is, and we just got acquired, so we got to do SAP integration. Um, that is tying those two together, your KPIs, your, program, your programmatic management and control of intellectual property, delegating it to the appropriate resources, and putting that in your management methodologies. Communicating to your executive team, getting that buy-in and support, understanding the impact of your business. That is what I believe has led us to be very successful so far in, in integrating open source into our business model. Um, it's about 5%, actually 5.8 billion now, so it's like infinitesimal percent. But um, uh, that, that's allowed us to be successful. I hope that you're able to take some of the things we talked about and implement these in your own, um, in, in your own, pro, in your own, in your own businesses. Um, I, I am co-authoring a book, Enterprise DevOps, um, with some people who are way smarter than me. I'm going to cover this in depth in, in, uh, in one of my chapters there. Um, it's, uh, there's no profit in the book. We're giving all the profits away to charity. So hopefully it's not, I'm not trying to withhold information. I'm just kind of overcommitted right now with the acquisition. So I put it on the deck. Uh, I can, I think we had, we're at the end of time, but I am going to come down here and, and we can talk, we can just hang out until he kicks out, right? Yeah, apparently. Cool. So uh, that concludes my talk on uh, successfully open sourcing as an operator.